Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Co. Here we are with some of our speakers that are with us in Co in Switzerland. A warm welcome also to our audience on site in Co. And most of you are actually joining uh, today's conversation on Zoom. So a very warm welcome. Uh, my name is Joël Germanier. I'm working for the CCHN and I have the pleasure to be moderating today's conversation. So why are we here today and what's the purpose of our conversation? So we heard this morning in the Open ceremony, we had some perspective from donors of humanitarian organization, representative of some of the major humanitarian agencies. They discussed and set the scene for us on what collaboration could look like in the humanitarian sector. Why is it needed? What are some of the complexity we are facing on the front lines and how collaborative approaches could help us to be better equipped to face those challenges. So from there, we want to now take a moment to discuss with amazing speakers we have around us that will help us figure out what they have been working on and how collaborative approaches have also been applied to other sectors and how this could be inspiring the humanitarian sector. So what's on the menu today? We'll start the first uh, part of the conversation with an exchange between our four panelists of today. And then we will give you an opportunity to exchange amongst yourself, among the participants. We will go into breakout rooms so that in small groups you can also reflect and think about what are some of the actions and the steps each of us can take at our own individual level to help foster collaboration in the humanitarian sector. And then we'll come back together to open the floor and go through a round of questions and answer with our panelists. So that's on the menu today. So let, uh, let me start introducing our first uh, speaker. So Mille Boja, you are the director for Europe for Rio's partner, which is an international social entropy specialized in multi-stakeholder uh, collaboration and especially in situations of uncertainty, complexity, and divergence. I think this talks a lot to us as humanitarian workers, of course, working mainly in crisis situations. You have over 20 years of experience uh, as a process designer, as a facilitator, but also as a team leader for social transformation and system change. Very glad to have you here today, Mille. And actually, we would like to, to hear from you. You are working a lot with organizations that at first maybe don't see the benefit of collaboration or feel maybe are focusing on the costs of it or what are some of the obstacles to it. So what's been your experience in trying to support those organizations, create an environment to help them to collaborate across organizations? And yeah, what's been some of the approaches you have applied and the learning from that? So, welcome and back to you, Mille. Right. Thank you, Joël. Yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I appreciate the work that you're doing at CCHN and it's really delightful to be able to be here to talk about collaboration, which is a subject that's close to my heart and at the heart of my work. Um, so, as you said, at RIOS Partners, we work on multi-stakeholder collaboration. Um, often we work with people who um, don't agree with each other, don't necessarily like or trust each other, but know that they're somehow interdependent. So they're part of the same problematic situation, even if they don't agree on what the problem is or what the solutions are. Um, and often situations of, of really high complexity. So some of the examples of, of um, issues that we've worked on is alternatives to the war on drugs, for example, working with people who promote a, a, an approach of, of um, criminalizing drugs and a security approach uh, with activists who want to legalize drugs um, and the whole spectrum in the room. Um, in other cases, people with different interests around energy transitions. Um, and recently we, for example, did uh, a project around justice innovation in Syria with Syrians from inside and outside Syria um, who have very uh, divergent perspectives, but all um, have an interest in, in people managing to solve their everyday legal problems that they face in a, in a post-war, protracted war situation. So that's just to give you an example, but we work on many different topics. Um, I'm not of the humanitarian space as such, um, but there's always this dimension of, of divergence and, and complexity and uncertainty in the work that we do. 
Um, and because of this, um, because of that complexity, the collaboration that we facilitate is not the same as collaborating with your friends and the people that you agree with. Um, it's really a stretch to collaborate with people that you don't agree with. And so we call it stretch collaboration in RIOS um, because it's a, it's a different kind of collaboration. It requires a different kind of muscle um, to work in this way. And so I wanted to share a couple of the things that we've learned about how to stretch collaborate across organizations, across different stakeholder groups and across sectors. Um, and the first um, key thing that we've understood from this work um, over many years is that collaboration is a choice. Um, and it's, uh, there are other options that we have. Um, so we can choose um, to do things our own way, to go it alone. We can choose to just build a coalition of the willing and work with our friends and allies. Um, we can choose to try and impose our view and uh, use our authority to have our way. And we can also choose to adapt to the authority of others and go their way. Um, all of those are not um, really collaboration. Um, and collaboration is not always the easiest choice to make. So David Harlan spoke earlier about interests. Collaboration is not always in the short-term interest. Um, it sometimes is costly, it sometimes is painful, um, and it sometimes is risky. And what I find in working with um, across these divergent interests is that it's really important to acknowledge that choice and the courage that people have in choosing to collaborate um, with diverse others. Um, I often see a kind of relief in the groups that we work with when we acknowledge that they're taking a risk in collaborating with others and, um, and that it, it's hard work and it's not necessarily the easiest choice, even if it is in the longer term uh, a more effective choice. Um, so that's uh, one of the key uh, learnings. A second key learning is that collaboration is a practice. Um, so I like this work around communities of practice that Jen was an inspiration for me many years ago. Um, <clears throat> so collaboration is a practice. It's actually a muscle that we need to build. It's not something that, at least collaboration with diverse others, is not something that always comes naturally to us. Uh, we may prefer the other options because they're easier, because we just haven't built that collaborative muscle or those capabilities. I think other, speak other speakers will address that as well. Um, <clears throat> and so what we, what we try to do in our work in RIOS Partners is to remove the obstacles to collaboration, um, to make it an easier choice for people to make. Um, and the way we do that is, I think, very related to what CCHN is doing starting um, acknowledging that we don't have to collaborate on any on everything that there are some things that we can collaborate on first and so this collaborating around learning around training and so on is a good example of that in our work we often bring together people to build scenarios of the future together they don't have to agree with each other on the the way forward they don't have to act together but they sit in a learning exercise and they develop shared knowledge products over the course of that process, they then build uh, mutual understanding, they build trust, they build relationships, and they build collaborative muscle, and then they're able to collaborate on something more ambitious afterwards. So how can we think about um, what are the specific domains where the barrier is lower to collaboration and not demanding so much agreement um, of people before they come into the room or not demanding too much commitment um, before they come into the room? That's the first thing. Second thing is to create good containers for collaboration. So this physical space is an amazing container. It feels safe. It, it, you, can, you can have confidential conversations here. So how do we create containers that are in um, appropriate physical spaces, but also appropriate um, psychological spaces and appropriately politically positioned um, in ways that enable people to collaborate with each other. So when I talk about containers, I really mean the spaces in which the collaboration happens. Um, and thirdly, um, to shift some of our assumptions about collaboration. Like I said, we don't have to agree on everything to collaborate. We can collaborate on some things and be in conflict on others. Um, we, um, we shouldn't assume that collaboration is easy. Um, we should acknowledge that it's difficult and we shouldn't assume that we know how to collaborate. We, we need to create spaces, maybe we need communities of practice about the, the practice of collaboration where we can also reflect on what kind of collaboration do we want to be in, what are we learning about collaboration itself. And collaboration is rarely the 
content of the conversation. It's the process, but it also sometimes needs to be the content. And just one final point um, is that um, in terms of crisis, one metaphor that we often use in our work is this idea of a mountain climb. So uh, when we're climbing the mountain, we need to focus. We need to um, be equipped. We need to have what we need in our backpack. We need to know um, each other very well um, so that we can uh, support each other. We need to know each other's strengths and weaknesses. When you're climbing the mountain is not the time when you're building the relationship. You need to build the relationship when you're at base camp. Um, and you need to make sure at base camp that you, that you get to know each other, you tell the stories around the fire, um, that you make sure everyone has what they need in the, ba in the backpack so that when you're climbing the mountain, um, you can climb. And um, I, that's how I think about crisis and relationship management as well. That someone said to me recently, you don't exchange business cards in a crisis. Um, so this idea of these sustained interactions to build relationships, you're not always in a crisis. So how do you build the relationships at other times, in other containers, in other spaces as you do, so that in a crisis you can activate those relationships and they can support you in, in times of need. So that's um, what I wanted to share and looking forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you very much, Bile. I think that's been... Uh extremely interesting to hear from your experience and all the work you do, especially as you say, in environments that are difficult and predictable, divergence is there, uh, how you still manage to build that collaborative muscles and that it, this notion that this is a muscle and it's a choice and it needs to have some efforts to make it happen. And I think you also uh, very well introduced our, our next speakers by also thinking about what are some of the assumptions we might have about collaboration, that is actually a choice and that there are some ways to that can support. And I think we, we've heard you talking about communities of practices and how communities of practices can be one of uh, that space uh, to create collaboration. And so I want to turn now to Beverly and Etienne wenger trainer who will uh, give us a bit of information about all the work you've been doing on the communities of practice. You are pioneers in social learning. You have um, written a number of books and studies on what communities of practice actually are and, uh, and how they differ from a group of people, for example. And uh, what we would like to hear from you today is really how community, what they are. First, what's the specific characteristics, but also how you think communities of practice can create that space for people to create relationship, to think about collaboration and how maybe this then transforms or helps transform uh, organizational change also. So back to you, welcome. Um, well, very simply, what we call a community of practice is not a collaborative relationship per se, but a learning partnership, recognizing other as learning partners for something that you care about doing and you want to learn how to make that difference. So it could be about humanitarian negotiations, it could be about how to design better brakes on trucks and cars, or it could be how to survive as a gang member in the streets of Los Angeles. So you, you find this kind of learning partnership in all sorts of domains, and over time you build a kind of shared repertoire that creates a regime of competence that becomes a bond between the members. So an example, we'll give you some examples. The, uh, I'll give you the example of the, the internal, internal auditors community of practice in Eastern Europe, Central Asia and Russia. These are internal auditors who work in finance ministries who um, traditionally under the, in, under the Soviet countries, they always had external auditors whose job was to check uh, and punish in order to, uh, the managers who are not keeping good accounts. Internal auditors help the managers. And so it was a big mind shift to go from external auditors to internal auditors. And this community of practice has people, has 24 members from different, from different 24 country members. And they come together to learn from and with each other what they're doing in each other's country to develop the practice of internal auditing in finance ministries. 
It's one of the longest running communities of practice that we've worked with and one of the most successful. And so you have in there, you have Russia, Georgia, um, countries that are often at war with each other. Uh, but anyway, in this community of practice, they work together on developing this competence and now their finance ministries in those countries have started to turn to the community of practice to find out, before they make a decision, they tell their internal auditor, go to your community of practice and find out what other countries are doing and then come back and we will base our decisions on that. And it's interesting because in that community of practice, when we first started, the person from the World Bank who was uh, sponsoring the community of practice, we spent probably two hours, three hours, deciding who's going to sit at whose table. Because Armenia and Azerbaijan, Georgia and Russia, Turkey and, and Armenia were there. And it was like a big problem. But I think over time, uh, people just saw each other as learning partners. And, we, and the question of who was sitting with whom disappeared. Well, their motto now is unity in diversity. They have an anthem, uh, a national anthem, well, not a national anthem, a community of practice anthem that they sing before each meeting all together. So their identity has gone beyond their country and uh, to being an internal auditor in this community of practice. They call themselves on their website, we are a professional family of peers. Yeah, and so that, this learning partnership allowed them to see a partner in someone with whom a, a, an age-old enmity exists. And the second example we wanted to mention is a, an example from business. Uh, at JP Morgan Chase, um, they have like 50,000 technologies, so it's a huge technology enterprise. And what is happening uh, through an initiative that has been going on for a few years now, is that there is a culture of starting communities of practice around challenges, technologies, issues that you care about. And the way that it is transforming the organization is that you as a technologist are not simply someone that's put on projects, a peon in a, in a big cogwheel. You are respected as a person who thinks strategically what are the capacities that we need to develop in order to be successful in what we're trying to do. So there is a sense of like, okay, if you want to start a community of practice because there is a, you need to, to find learning partners around the organization. You go online, you, you, you make a proposal, people vote, and, and there's a process by which you can start that learning partnership uh, uh, with people locally and then uh, also across the world. And a third example is an infectious disease surveillance community of practice who started because they were monitoring infectious diseases within their own countries. They, they were um, mostly medical staff, epidemiologists. And of course, they very quickly realized that they needed people across borders because infectious disease crosses borders very quickly. So you were much better at monitoring an infectious disease if you were in close contact with the health people in countries nearby. Um, and so that was a very uh, tight community of practice. Very quickly, of course, they realized that actually often infectious diseases come from animals to people. So we must have at the table people in animal health. We need, we need uh, networks which include veterinarians, uh, animal, um, cattle veterinarians. They came into the community of practice. A little bit of tension because actually um, medical uh, health people, doctors, are seen or have a higher status than animal doctors. Uh, so there was potentially, or there was a few conflict there around power issues, um, but they had to resolve this problem of um, infectious disease surveillance and they managed it. Then they brought in wildlife. And so gradually they brought in people who were traditionally from different professions, but managed to make this work in the service of getting faster and quicker 
at detecting infectious disease. So that's interesting because there you had both the countries, right? There was Palestine and, and Israel, for instance, were part of the community, and you had the different practices. Why should I listen to you? You, you deal with cows, you know? So, so that's it. it's interesting uh, to see how a learning partnership for, forces people to seek, uh, uh, to seek partnership beyond their little uh, world. So even though a community of practice is actually not about collaboration, because a community of practice is about learning, it's learning how do we do this better? How do we get better at doing internal audit in the public sector? How do we get better at being technologists in JP Morgan? How do we get better at monitoring infectious disease surveillance? So although it's about learning, it becomes a catalyst of collaborative capability. People start to collaborate because in order to solve the problem, they need to collaborate. Uh, and what is interesting is that when we, we did some interviews within CCHN um, of members of the community, one thing that we heard quite a few times is that people said having a shared repertoire, having this shared language about negotiation allows you to coordinate with other people from other organizations. So it is interesting that it allows a sort of collaboration at the level of practice, even though perhaps at the political level or at the, at the organizational level, people see, don't really see each other as collaboration. So we should also distinguish between collaboration that happens at the level of practice, where people shared a repertoire and a perspective, and collaboration at more at the political level of, of organizational territories. Well, excellent. Thank you very, very much for also sharing all those examples and reminding us that, you know, communities of practice have always been there and they are there because people need it and see the value in it. And, uh, and I really like also your term of, you know, uh, learning partners, because I think that's what brings you to a community of practice. Thank you very much for also, and I, I heard uh, a similar point to what Mila said, you reminded the importance or maybe let's say deconstructing some assumptions that we think that to collaborate we need to agree. And I think that's a key point you also mentioned communities of practice. You don't need to agree on everything, right? To, to make, if you're there, it's because you want to improve the practice. And actually, if there is too much agreement, it's yeah. a red flag. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much for bringing that in. And now I would like to turn to our third speaker, I mean fourth speaker, Barbara Brock. Um, you are the founder and president of Global Development Geneva that is aimed at building bridges, again, also across sectors, across disciplines, and trying to find sustainable solutions uh, and cultivate system change. You have over 25 years of experience in leadership be it in business, global diplomacy, health, international development, to name just a few. Um, so I think what we would like to hear from you is from your personal and professional experiences. What are some of the shifts that are needed to enable us to make that step and actually collaborate, be it at the individual level, at the collective level, and also at the system level? So welcome and back to you, Barbara. Thank you, Joël. First of all, uh, thank you for having me here. And I have to say, I have such a deep respect for humanitarian community, especially for the frontline workers. I cannot imagine the suffering and the alleviation of suffering and preservation of dignity that you are all uh, concerned about. I. My background is uh, as a natural scientist and as a social scientist. And I would like to start uh, a few points with a short video. I would like to remind us what is it that we can learn from nature. Can we have the video? Yeah. Yeah. So this is an example that happened this month in Australia, in the state of Victoria. Uh, the capital is Melbourne. And you know that uh, Australia was hit by several natural disasters. 
and continues. So what happened? What we are observing are spider webs. These are so-called sheet spiders, and uh, they use the special technique to survive. And what they do, they connect with each other, their webs, and this, what happened a few weeks ago, is something unprecedented because of the scale uh, that emerged. What happened, the spiders, as you know, were one of the first species that came on land over 400 mil million years ago, so substantially older than humans. Yet, one ask yourself, what is it that we can learn about collaboration from the living system so they use this lifting technique, so-called ballooning, to lift themselves, connect the web nets, uh, to lift themselves about the surface and survive. Um, I would like to use this as a reminder what kind of world we are living in. And my focus is specifically on looking at designing a new social structures that are emerging today. Both of you mentioned uh, some of those emergent that is happening, and uh, one of my favorite uh, eco-writers, eco eco-practitioners, uh, Joanna Macy, calls this time great turning. And great turning means that we are living in a time when we are moving from unlimited growth, industrial growth society, towards profound shift into life-sustaining society. So obviously, as Joel mentioned, what are those shifts that we really need to make a shift into the new society? And what kind of collaborative structures do we need? And I would like us to imagine together uh, three shifts and try to imagine not just to think about the shifts, but try to feel the shifts, try to sense the shifts, try to think what kind of shifts we can experience. And the first shift that I would like to mention is a need for a shift in a perspective. And we live in a world where we are used to a linear way of thinking, and the crisis management is a very good example of a linear way of thinking which means that we primarily focus on behaviors and surface symptoms. And of course, it's very difficult to address the crisis if you only focus on the symptoms. It's like when I'm having a headache and I take a pill instead of actually understanding why am I having a headache? Why maybe it's a stress, maybe it's a lack of food, lack of liquid, or maybe altogether. Uh, so this is one big problem that we humans are not used to think in a way of complexities. We are used to managing, we have designed the system in silos. We are, we are used to think from A to B to C instead of looking at the maps. So in global development, we develop system maps to first try to understand the interconnectedness between various factors to go really beyond the systems. And um, I would like to say also that uh, the humanitarian community is in a way, uh, a silo that is starting to connect more and more with developmental community and is starting to connect more with sustainable development goals and looking at the whole system as the whole. So this is another good example how it's really necessary that we start to connect the communities and silos in the overall system. And the second important thing, and maybe that's even more important thing, is really shift in consciousness. And we are called uh, a species, our species is called Homo sapiens sapiens. And it's a very interesting name. So it's, it's the name that means this is a, a species that knows about, that thinks about how we think. So we really understand we are aware to be aware. And why I'm mentioning that, I find that very interesting that we have forgotten about our deep awareness uh, of sensing what is actually happening uh, in our lives and you know, the planetary scale, as well as with uh, 
us as individuals. And I think this goes back to uh, the notion of values. What is it that we value? Do we value something external or do we value something that's internal, that it's important for us as the human beings, as, as the humans that are part of the natural system? Uh, so really, as Joel uh, mentioned earlier, it's really important to think, what do we value? As, you, as we know, that current economic system is focused of, on primarily measures value with the notion of transaction, money, and uh, GDP. Yet the values are deeper values, and uh, you both ni nicely talk about the values, how the communities are sustained and created. That's another important uh, shift. The third shift uh, that I think it's very important is a shift in patterns of collaboration. Uh, today, several of these patterns were already mentioned. I think we are seeing profound shift the way the society is being organized. We have, shift, we have seen a shift with spiders, how they have shifted that something that has never been seen before at the scale. And you know, I always ask myself, uh, we as species are estimated only 90,000 to 160,000 years old, and yet spiders are there 400 million years old. What did it go wrong? How did we design the society that we are facing such a profound problems? Um, I would like to share a few practical examples of new patterns of organizations that uh, I have been involved closely and continue. The one such pattern clearly is emerging uh, quite rapidly uh, due to the COVID pandemic. And there are a number of reshuffling of the society, how it's being organized and uh, various new structures between public, private, civic, and the communities have emerged. One of them is ACT Accelerator that is focused on accelerating uh, development and supply and delivery of all tools and solutions for, uh, not just for uh, of vaccine, but all various technologies. And uh, we have done a very interesting study that the UK government supported, that we researched around 20 organizations that are called uh, so-called product development partnerships. So it's entirely, uh, it's not a new forum orga organization, but it's not so well-known forum organization. These are uh, non-profit uh, organizations of uh, public, private, and academic partners, and they develop a network, so-called virtual orchestra, all around the world to accelerate, uh, facilitate the uh, research and development of various innovations. And interestingly enough, you know, this is a non-profit model, so it really showed that it, they are not only for-profit models, uh, that we mostly are familiar with. There are also non-profit models that are feasible, and in fact, they have been transformational with over 70 new technologies have been developed. Another fascinating example is coming from the field of food systems. Uh, food systems, as you know, it's, uh, you, many of you are dealing with uh, various food crises on the ground, and it's not just the food insecurity, it's also the food production, it's a food supply chain, uh, it's a food distribution and food consumption. And of course, all stakeholders have to come together. Uh, the businesses, the academia, the scientists, the governments, the cities, the communities, uh, and so on and so forth. And certainly a very important component in this is a smallhold farmer, farmers. And there are various initiatives that have emerged, including the fresh alliance between uh, the World Business Council and it and the scientific communi community to really uh, rethink how the food systems can be reorganized. And the last one I want to mention uh, is uh, the re-emergence of practices of commoning. 
And common ink is really uh, about caring about the common resources. And there are different kinds of common ink in, from gardening to taking care about the air to taking care about common spaces, public spaces in the urban environment and so on and so forth. But if I look at the uh, interesting example that happened during the crisis in, um, migrant crisis in, in Greece, it was a self-organized uh, commoning that emerged by activists and uh, immigrants uh, kind of occupying an empty hotel and kind of self-organizing to uh, address it in the needs of migrants because the government was not taken care of. So the last thing I want to say that commoning is uh, a very ancient practice that is re-emerging towards the shaping possibly some new systems, some new values, common values that are not necessarily transactional. And what is interesting is that the, the notion of scale in common ink is different. The scale is by multiplying the numbers of common ink experience, just like in multiplying the number of uh, communities of practice. So the notion of scale is by nurturing many, many smaller communities, not necessarily the traditional models of top-down that we see in development and humanitarian aid. And the last thing, um, I'm just inspired and in what I see in my work, uh, working with all these stakeholders, what is profoundly missing is imagination. We think that things need to go on the way they were done before, and I would like to quote uh, one of my favorite poets, Diane Prima. She says that the only war that matters is the war against imagination. All other wars are subsumed in it. And if we can awaken ability to reimagine we can reimagine how we collaborate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara, also for you know reminding us that nature knows how to collaborate and how we can be inspired and learn from from nature. And uh, I think our four panelists have done an amazing job in giving us a number of examples where collaboration is actually happening and what are some of the, the factors that help this collaboration. And now, as we are 118 people online, we want to give you the opportunity to interact between yourself. And from what you heard from our panelists here, think about at your own level, what are some of the steps and actions you can actually take to foster, promote peer-to-peer -peer collaboration in the humanitarian sector. Here we've heard how collaboration has been successfully implemented in a diversity of sectors. Let's now refocus to the humanitarian sector and see how this can help us to be better equipped to face the complexity we have in the field. So to do so, now we will send you into breakout rooms where you will have one CCHN staff facilitating a conversation so that you have a, really a chance to, to bring in your perspective. And after that, we will all come back in plenary together and go through a round of questions and final exchange with our panelists. So you will now see on your screen an invitation to join one of the breakout rooms for 20 minutes and then we will see you back here. So wishing you a really good conversation. Our speakers will also join the breakout rooms online with you to be part of the conversation. So see you back in 20 minutes. So welcome back everyone from your breakout rooms. We hope you had a really interesting conversation um, and that you found some of the steps and actions that you can take at your individual level to foster collaboration. Um, what we would like to do now is we would like to have a last opportunity in even smaller groups to reflect together during 10 minutes what are maybe some of the challenges you still feel uh, you have ahead of us to be able to really apply those collaborative approaches. And while you think about that with your peers in small groups, think if there is one critical question you may want to bring back 
to our panelists here to close this, this session. So we will send you back into small groups for last reflection, and then we'll all come back here and take a few of your questions and, and think about a way forward. So you'll be sent back into breakout rooms for 10 minutes, and then we'll conclude together. So enjoy the second part of the conversation. Thank you. So welcome back to plenary for the last part of today's sessions, where we will have now a moment to listen to some of your questions. Uh, we hope you had a really interesting conversation with your peers in the small breakout rooms. And now we have a last 20 minutes to look at some of the questions. What I would like you to do is, if you have a critical question, reflection you want to bring up to our panelists, please use the chat. I see some of you are already using it, and, uh, and we will take a couple of them for the ones that we can't answer now. There is, you know that we will be uh, having spaces of communication and exchange throughout this week, and there are chats that are there for you, so the conversation will be ongoing. So let me start with a first question I see in the chat here. Um, how to build trust and collaboration in the short term when actors are changing every few months? And I think that's, that's a very uh, appealing question for the humanitarian sector where there are so many changes going on. So building trust. Um, I'm thinking maybe, Mille, would you feel like taking that one? <laughs> it's part of your work. <laughs> Yes, I, I thought that one might go to me. Is this the last time that I should say anything? Probably. Okay, so maybe I'll just add a little bit more to that sure. then. Um, so I think this is, one of the things that I was listening to in the breakout groups was, um, I think there's one voice in this system that says, let's collaborate among individuals in spite of our organizations. It's like the organizations are getting in the way of the collaborating, and so we're just gonna collaborate as individuals. And I think, um, I understand that, but I think there's a risk in that. And, and this question is part of that risk when the individuals are changing. If there's no relationship between the organizations or you're not shifting the way people view the organizations and view each other's organizations, then you're gonna have a problem when those actors keep changing. So you're gonna have to also include the organizations in the conversation um, and understand basically um, what I noted down is get to know each other and each other's organizations, understanding the we that people are a part of within those organizations and start creating a different conversation about the organizations that then permeates the, the bigger system. So these people may be changing, but most likely many of them are staying in the humanitarian system. So if you lift your perspective up a level and say, how are we creating the the perceptions of each other as organizations and how are we creating a culture in the system overall so that those people, when they move around, they're bringing a different view of the we that is the organizations and the we that is the overall humanitarian system. Um, so, yeah, I, I hope that makes sense, but I've seen that a lot in my work, that people shift roles, but they still say, stay somehow in the field. And so if we can lift, lift our perspective up a notch. Um, I, I wanted to just comment on one other thing um, that I, I saw another question there and I heard in the breakout groups. Um, and you also asked me, why is it difficult for uh, the humanitarian sector to collaborate? And I think uh, what, I, what I said to Joelle when she asked me that question is there are many reasons not to collaborate. There are many legitimate reasons not to collaborate. But what I heard in the breakout groups is also the many reasons to collaborate. and. It feels like in this sector, everything is so intense. It's like it's life or death. If you don't collaborate and it's life or death, you, you, there are serious risks if you do. Um, so I want to acknowledge that. And um, I think um, th this idea of focusing the collaboration more is important in terms of finding the places to collaborate. That's an important starting point. And then I just want to bring back what one of the speakers earlier said about gender and about women in this sector. And I think if, if this is going to change, there has to be a balance of masculine and feminine energies. Um, and that's not about men and women. I, it's 
to see them as energies, but it does require rebalancing and a system that is um, primarily male is going to struggle to make this transformation. And so I just want to put a, a, an exclamation mark on that comment earlier. Give voice to women and give voice to the feminine and to the feminine values of relationship and a, a, a system view, the we um, and the collaborative. Thank you very much, Mila, and also for jumping in basically to another question we, we had on the chat. And, uh, and I'm, I'm going to use the privilege of having the mic here to turn around to, um, to Bev and Etienne to really that element of building trust, especially when we maybe disagree, when we don't have consensus from your experiences. How does this happen within communities of practice? This idea of, we heard, you know, identity, trust, who is a member, who is not a member. Could you also elaborate a bit on that one? Yeah, I have to say that we actually, we very rarely talk about trust when we work with people or actually collaboration. It is rarely the goal in itself. Okay? So when, for example, with those internal auditors, when they join the community, they very much have an identity of, I am Russian, I am Ukrainian, I am Turkey, I am from Abazajan. So, so you have a particular identity. But when you realize, in, in that community, when they realize that they all need to build some, um, I don't know, a set of guidelines for internal auditors, and it's going to be easier to do it together, get people working on something, mm. right? And where what your, your experience in that space matters, where your voice matters, in order to deal with the project at hand, the problem at hand, then trust comes out of that. It's a consequence of it. Collaboration comes because you've got to do something else. And so that identification with something that is not your country, but your identification with, in that case, the internal auditors, suddenly the identification with being Russian or being Ukrainian dissolves. So... Um, yeah, so... And I think it's, it's really important to see this happening at multiple levels of scale, okay? Because there is the practice of negotiation, but an important practice that we heard about a lot in our interviews is the practice of framing negotiation, which is kind of a semi-managerial practice of sending people into a context with certain red lines, or maybe, maybe not even mentioning red lines. And then there's, there's of course, a practice of managing an organization like the Red Cross or, or the UNHCR organization. So these are different practices, and they have different forms of legitimacy. And I think where a community of practice like yours is really important is to bring the voice of practice into that whole discourse, because often, the voice of practice is left to itself. Okay? And we have found that in some cases, the kind of legitimacy that comes from being a community of practice that reflects on practice gives a strength to the voice of saying, you may think that this policy is a good idea, but in practice, it's totally counterproductive. And that voice has to be heard. The, because when you are a policymaker living at 30,000 feet, you often don't realize that your policies don't work on the ground. And so, to hear the voice of practice, and, and so, I think that for you as a community, developing how to do good negotiation is one part of your work. Developing what that practice would expect from managers sending you into this context is an important thing to learn and to contribute. And then, what the policies at an organizational level do to that whole process is an important voice to be heard because these people who, who you think are not doing that, it's hard when you're at 30,000 feet, you know? And it's important that the community give the legitimacy to the voice of the practitioner who is experiencing the work, who is experiencing collaboration and not collaboration, really. On a on, on, on a day to day basis, but also for managers, if you give a red line to your people, 
How do you know that your red line is the same as, as the red line of the, of, of the other manager who's sending them? And if it's, not, if it's not the same, then all of a sudden they undermine each other because they, everything is brought down to the, to the lowest level. So what I'm saying is that, is that as an organization, you, and as a committee of practice, you, you need to be clear about that. You need to be clear about the messages you send to other practices that are related to yours for how you can do your job better. Excellent. Thank you very much for making the link, right? How you practice is also having an influence over all the practices and how all this is interconnected. And I think we see in the chat there is a lot of, you know, reflection questions on, on also, we, we talking a lot, of course, about what are the advantages of collaboration because you have all working on that and have seen the positive implications of collaboration. But we also see in the chat there are still a number of questions that people ask themselves related to some of the risk uh, or costs of such a uh, collaboration. You mentioned some of it, it merely by saying it's, it's difficult to collaborate and maybe we should see where we need to collaborate and where it's not necessary. And linked to that, Barbara, I want to hear from uh, the, the, not just the humanitarian sector, but maybe other, you, you, you shared many examples where collaboration had fruitful implications. Here we see in the chat, you know, but what about the risk that this increased collaboration can have on institution, we disclosing maybe sensitive information, confidential in, uh, information. We might also leave, uh, lose our competitive advantage because we now working together. So also all this notion on competition and what about the resources? Because I think you all agree that collaboration doesn't happen just like naturally, it's an effort. They need to invest time and, and create the, the right environment to, to make it happen. So what would be your reaction to, to these risks or costs that are being uh, shared here? Thank you for asking. I have, I have to say that what came out during the breakup room, it was linked to what you mentioned, was a lot of questions around uh, conflict because of the confidentiality and transparency. And when this is present in the space, obviously the communication is limited, the coordination is limited, the common, everything is limited, the cooperation is limited, collaboration is limited. And the question is how, this can, how can this be addressed? Um, and we know that at the core is the communication, open communication, and even understanding what is what cannot be disclosed or why is it that cannot be disclosed. Uh, I think it's extremely important. I think the other uh, issue that I think it's important, and I'll go back to what I said uh, earlier, is expanding the perspective. Why is it that co we collaborate or compete? Why is it? Do we see a bigger picture is it only that I need to deliver a food or supplies? Or can I look at the bigger system? Who else is part of the system? Not only in humanitarian sector, but also outside of the humanitarian sector. And I think this is essential to really expand the boundaries of our perspectives and then evaluate risks as a bigger picture, not only in our so-called uh, small bubble. And last thing I want to say that we are essentially, as citizens of this planet, we are all becoming humanitarian workers. The planet is in crisis, so there is a lot that we can learn from humanitarian sector. How do we deal with crisis? And as I mentioned before, it's also important that we don't look at the crisis as the crisis is only short term. We are in a long term crisis. We have to change perspective and look at the entire system and look for other collaborators outside the sectors to address much bigger risk that you are addressing, Joelle. Thank you very much, Barbara. And actually, I would like to give you Back to floor, Mille, just because I'm sure that what we're reading here is a very common argument you hear from organizations you're working uh, with when they start at, again, 
looking at some of the costs of collaboration and uh, really in a pragmatic way, what would be your first reaction answer to, to, to this? So yeah, exactly what we heard, you know, like competition, transparency, uh, losing competitive advantage, I guess that that's really coming out from the humanitarian sector, but you've been working for his education organization and other where I guess you have similar experience, similar reactions. What would be your first um, answer to that? Well, I think that I think um, we need to see those structures as part of the work that we need to do in the world. So we have to look at what these incentives are that are constraining us and create changes to those structures so that we incentivize a long-term perspective, that we, um, you know, that we incentivize collaboration, um, that, we, that, we that we create time for that um, in people's job descriptions and things that have been mentioned earlier today. So it's about looking at the structural level of the organization as a place of intervention. Um, so maybe that's the next assignment for you, <laughs> collaborating around that. Thank you. I'd like now to just see in the room if there is any last reaction, common question anyone, anyone would like to bring in also from our on-site audience today. Okay. It doesn't seem so, so I think we will slowly close uh, this very interesting conversation we had. Thank you very much to all of you. And I know there is more going on on the chat. And please, you are all reminded that the conversation doesn't end here. We have ahead of us seven days of engagement. And please use all the spaces we have created for those conversations to happen on our Kiko platform. You're invited to use the chat, the networking areas to really continue that conversation that we have just started here. So I really would like to warmly thank our speakers today for sharing those examples, opening our horizon on how things are also being run in different sectors and, uh, and taking the time to be with us uh, today. So thank you very, very much. And uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation over the six days to come. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>